Martin. I am the host of Financial Footsteps, and I'm also a uh, recruiter. I've been doing that for 27 years. I am the owner and operator of Integrated Management Resources, which is also the sponsor of this firm, and we specialize in placing finance talent in Phoenix and abroad. And uh, so I'm happy to have a very special guest today by the, by the name of Joe Udall. And Joe is, uh, I don't want to take too much thunder away from him, but he's currently the Senior Director of Finance for a local company by the name of Keep. So thank you for, for joining today, Joe. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Chad. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and kind of talking about my journey. Absolutely. So I just learned that we're, uh, we're both natives. Yep. That's pretty cool. Uh, when I meet other people that are not native, they're always like, wow, it's uh, I've never really met another native before. But you and I growing up here, we clearly know a lot of natives. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, grew up with a lot of people that have been here for a while. I think, like I mentioned, my family's been here since, you know, the 1850s, some of the original settlers and then my wife's family as well. You know, we both, you know, long lineage here in, in Arizona. That's fantastic. That's so cool. I'm first generation. Yeah. So the, what generation are you? Do you know? And then your kids would be. I think I'm fifth generation Arizonan so on six. both sides. Yeah. Cool. So talk. tell me about um, family. How, how many kids do you have? Yeah. So I've got three kids. I've got Charlie, my oldest, is a seven-year-old boy. And my daughter, Emily, is four. And then my youngest is two and a half, which is Zachary, married to my wife, Lucy Barney, uh, if you know any Barneys here in Arizona. Um, you know, we've been here since 2017. You know, we met at BYU up in Utah, you know, and then my first job I got down here is with Keep, you know, formerly Infusionsoft. And, you know, they've been really good to me and I've, we've been here ever since. Fantastic. So no shortage of excitement going on at your house. Yes. Very busy with a lot of little kids running around doing different events. You know, like two of my kids have gymnastics today. And so they're, you know, just loving running around and tumbling. And, you know, I love watching, you know, the joy that they get from kind of experiencing the world. Any carnage, any broken stuff, or is it pretty oh, mellow at your house? Yeah, definitely a lot of broken stuff. We get a lot of bruised faces. You know, my my two and a half year old is the right size to hit my daughter's orbital bones right now. So she has a black eye at least once a month from oh them colliding. And I, I, I tell her teacher preschool, I'm like, I promise it's her younger brother, uh, but it looks bad a lot. So you get CPS called on you all the time, right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I remember my first experience with my son had uh, what's called breath holding spells and he passed out and like hit his head and had this bruise and we had we took him to the hospital because we didn't know what this thing was and, and we we're getting questioned by CPS like did you cause this so I'm like no no I swear it just passed yeah. out and so uh, yeah and then uh, my other son well my one son broke my other son's arm and I got CPS yeah. again questioning us you know so I've been through that routine a few times. Yeah. Now we luckily no broken bones yet, but I, I know with my youngest it's coming, right? He oh, throws coming. himself with abandon everywhere. He's like the kid in the pool that, you know, he just runs and jumps in. Doesn't matter how deep it is. And he we we you know, we did the uh, swimming so that he can learn how to float. Um, but he just has no fear of anything. Well, let me give you some advice. So, you know, we're my youngest son, I was always like, Well, rub some dirt on it, you'll be yeah. fine. Don't worry about it. And hey, we're and don't tell my dad, but they were jumping on a trampoline, which my dad was totally against in the backyard. Older son landed on younger son's arm and he heard a crack and he comes in. He's like, dad, my arm hurts. I'm like, oh, you're fine. Just rub some dirt on it. And then finally, two days later, we were at the older son's soccer event and the younger son was just playing with his off hand. And I look at my wife and I'm like, uh, I think we need to go get him checked. And to this day, that had to be 10 years ago, he still reminds me about it probably once a week. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you remember, you never remember. You don't trust me and believe me that I broke my arm. And so word of advice to you. Just believe him. Just believe him, baby. You know, the <laughs> irony is I actually broke my younger brother's arm. You know, we were playing football in the backyard and I tackled him and landed on him. And he broke, you know, a couple bones in his forearm. And. I, he created a pinched nerve later in life. He's definitely had some issues. And I do feel a little bit about that, bad about that one. Uh, yeah, he didn't do it intentionally. Yeah. So let's go back. Uh, BYU, why'd you choose BYU? Uh, I think the short answer is, you know, I grew up LDS. So it was always kind of, a, you know, aspiration to go there. I had good enough grades. Tuition's very cheap. You know, my grandparents basically would kind of funneled everyone there by saying we will pay BYU tuition for every semester anywhere you go right so I went to ASU you know they're only paying BYU tuition so if you go to BYU you don't have to pay for anything so that was I think the initial reason I attended BYU 
Um, you know, it's a great school, you know, very strong academics, especially the business school. So I, uh, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do when I went there initially. You know, I then went and served my mission for a couple of years in Puerto Rico. You know, they're only paying BYU tuition and then came back. Um, and when I came back, I originally went into political science. You know, like I mentioned, my family's been here a long time. It's they're all lawyers, right? My father's a lawyer. Three of his brothers and brother-in-laws are lawyers. My grandfather's a lawyer. His father, uh, Jesse Addison Udall, and his brother were both on the Arizona Supreme Court as the Arizona Supreme Court justices. So, you know, long lineages of attorneys here. And the one thing I always said is, I think I don't want to be an attorney. So that's where I started is not a lawyer as opposed to being any. And so I just started exploring other things. I did political science. So I have a political science minor, uh, didn't love the writing. And then eventually I looked at, you know, finance and accounting applied to both programs and got accepted, ended up picking finance and kind of the rest is history. I just, I knew I needed in a skill set that would translate, right? Like, and I, I figured with finance or accounting, you know, any business needs those and learning the language of business will help me in whatever I want to do. Where did that, where did that realization happen? for you? I feel like I was sitting in a political science class where we were writing, you know, 20 page paper, papers once a week. And I thought to myself, I don't want to do this for a living, right? I don't want to just be writing policy papers. I had done like model UN uh, in high school and in college, where essentially you go and you try to, you know, get legislation passed in this mock environment representing some country. And I realized I'm like, I don't like love this. You know, I've always enjoyed politics, but I'm like the actual like sausage making of politics. I'm like, I I, I became a little disillusioned with it, to be frank. And so I was like, I want to go somewhere where I feel like I can make more of a difference. And I felt like in business, you know, you know, that's kind of what helps make the world go round. Right. Uh, and so that's kind of what I pursued. And I, I knew I could make some money there as well. Right. I, I always wanted to be, you know, middle class, right. Or upper middle class. That's kind of what I grew up in. And so I knew kind of what the expectations were to get there. Right. You have to get a good education and go get a good job. And so that was kind of the driving force. Gotcha. Was that an easy conversation to have with the parents and, and the grandparents? I had teased my dad my entire life that I was not going to be a lawyer. I've been quite insistent. That that's the only thing I was not going to be. And so of all his kids, none of us are attorneys, whereas some of my other cousins, you know, there is at least one or two attorneys in every one of their families, but our family, there's no attorneys. So we got two finance guys, you know, a nurse and then my youngest sister is graduating as a writer. So definitely kind of an interesting path. And my dad does say, he's like, I wish one of you guys would have come so I could pass my law firm on, right? He runs his own small business law firm in Mesa, but you know, it didn't come to pass. Yeah. I remember my, after my second year in college, I called my dad and told him I wanted to take a gap year, but I dreaded that call so much. I was like, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? And I, when I told him I held the phone away and he said, great, sounds good. When are you coming home? And so it, it just, you, you know, you build these things up. And so I, that's, uh, that's good though, that you already had laid all that groundwork with your dad. Yeah. And my parents were very supportive. They, they just wanted us to have a plan, right? It's like, they're like, we don't really care what you do as long as you have a plan and it helps you to achieve your goals. Uh, my grandparents, my dad's parents were a little more strict, right? They were paying our BYU tuition, but we had to like write them a letter every year that had a budget. And they would basically tell us like some of my cousins were told like, hey, that major is like not going to do anything. So you should probably pick something different, right? So they were like the STEM majors only. And then everything else was kind of like, well, maybe you should do something different. They were pretty, you know, I wouldn't say strict. They would still fund the tuition, but they definitely would harass you a little bit. So they were very pleased that I was going into finance. Uh, and so, you know, from there, it just kind of, you know, it's worked. What a cool idea. Yeah. You got to write a letter with a business case of what you're doing. Yeah. That's, no, it was literally, I had to say, here's what I'm doing with all the funds. Here's what I'm doing with my life. Here's my budget, you know, for, you know, housing and rent and books. And it was very, very cool idea. You know, very generous of them. You know, they have like, you know, 40 or 50 grandchildren, right? So they've been paying a ton of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars to help fund education because it's something that's very important to them. Right. And so, you know, my wife's family actually did the same thing. She comes from a family of farmers, but they, you know, had trust that helped fund, you know, their education, right? It's something that's been instilled in both of us and that we're attempting to pass on to our children. What a fascinating idea. Yeah. I may borrow that yeah. when I, with, with, if and when I become a grandparent. Yeah. So, well, you've only got two kids. So, hopefully, there's not too many grandkids. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I don't know that I could afford 40 or 50. That's for sure. So, you, so there's been a lot of conversation about a lack of accountants and, uh, it's just really hard to find staff accounts just because not a lot of people are going into accounting. You chose finance. What was the genesis of that choice versus accounting? Yeah. So I, so the way the BYU finance and accounting programs work is you could only apply in the fall. Right. And because I had been doing a different major, um, in political science, I essentially finished my coursework 
in December and then had to wait until the following fall to apply. So I said, you know, what, what should I do? I should probably just go get a finance or accounting job. So I actually got a bookkeeping job here in the Valley with uh, Vista Senior Living. You know, they own a couple properties around the Valley. But essentially, I did all the bookkeeping at the corporate level for them. And for me, it was a good experience to say, okay, if I love this, then I'll probably pick the accounting program. If I kind of hate it, then I'll probably pick something, then I'll probably pick the finance program, right? And I, you know, as we were doing the books every day, or every every month, I realized the part I enjoyed about my conversation was when we talk about what's the future strategy we're going to do, right? The actual mechanics of closing the books were fine. You know, I found like some errors in the way they've done their property taxes in the past, but I was like, this part doesn't excite me. What excited me is that, you know, it was me and the CEO and the, the COO, and the CFO in a room. It was the four of us in this tiny little room where I'm over here doing the books and they're talking about all the strategy, right? And then they would involve me in those conversations. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to help, you know, drive the future of the company. You know, I was there, they, you know, looked and eventually acquired another property. And now they've, you know, five, six, seven X from what I, what it was when I was there in 2013. It's been really cool to watch that growth. Uh, and I, and I feel like a lot of that's, you know, live been driven by the visionary leadership and then the, you know, financial strategy that helped them execute on that. And that, that's what I wanted to do. So when it came time to pick a program and accept, I picked finance. Got you. Any regrets there? Um, I don't know if I have any regrets. Um, I do. I as I've come more into the process, I do feel like if you come up as a CPA, there definitely are some advantages. If you're trying to get all the way to the heights of CFO, you can definitely do it as a finance only. But there are definitely some companies that if you don't have the CFA, they just won't look at you. CPA. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's a regret. I think I've enjoyed my you know work life a lot better in what I've been doing. But maybe it will you know hinder me at the top end. Do you have any other internships besides uh, the one? Yes. With the yeah. So I did an internship in Dallas with a retail company. They're called at home. Um, they have a couple, you know, stores here mm -hmm. in the Valley, but they essentially sell, sell home decor, um, huge in Texas. And then they've kind of been branching out. So I went and I was on the finance team and I ended up actually doing a lot of support for like the real estate function. You know, so like I have like a memory of being in the office really late, getting ready for essentially this two or three all day review of all the potential like sites in the nation that they could expand to. Right. So it was like six or 700 sites, three or four pages each copying them all, getting it all ready. And essentially we just went through and we reviewed all these sites of places they could potentially expand to. And it's been cool to see them go to some of those. Right. And it was a really eye opening on, you know, what it takes to do like real estate, you know, at a, at a corporate level site evaluation. And then as well as just seeing what the corporate finance side of a, essentially a retail company looked like. So great experience, you know, kind of wanted to come back, but then I ended up graduating in December, right? Because I had been, I essentially, you know, was ahead on some of my credits, but it, it kind of messed up my graduating on time schedule. So I graduated in December, so six months early. And then I networked into the job I got here at Keep. It was essentially my wife's sister's, you know, husband's brother. So we share, this guy, Austin Call and I, we share a sister-in-law, um, that he he knew they were hiring a job on the other finance team and so i applied and it was like over christmas break so i remember we're at like this cabin in provo utah and i'm like on a call doing the homework with them and then i basically started when we got back from break so wow yeah. that happened quick for it you. was very quick yeah i like started talking to him in early december and by like the second or third week of january i was starting so, so. You, you didn't look at any other jobs i had been applying and looking at other jobs i considered going the investment banking route but i think as you and i discussed it's a lot of hours and my wife and I had talked, is that like the life we want, right? Because essentially, I'm like, I will just probably not be there for a while. And we, you know, I had our first child that November. So Charlie was born my last semester of school. Um, and so I just basically had to decide, like, do I want to try to be there and find a corporate job where I can be more around? Or, you know, we discussed doing IB uh, and we decided it kind of wasn't right for us. Did at home offer you a job? Um, they did not. They ended up not hiring any interns. They were kind of going through some restructuring at the time. So, gotcha. Yeah. So tell me about your thoughts on what you thought the job was going to be. You sit down, you start doing it. But, you know, tell me about that first couple months. Yeah, no, definitely. The first couple, I would say the first year um, was just, you know, drinking from a fire hose, right? It's learning how do you interact with business partners. Um, and I, I guess the job that I was hired for was supporting the sales and marketing teams, right? So I did the revenue, ex revenue support, as well as some of the expense support, but the heavy emphasis on revenue at that time, you know, I, you know, it has changed now, but there was a period where I used to say, I'm like, like, we care about our budgets, but we really care about our revenue, right? Like, if we have to spend more to get what we need, we'll do that, right? It, it like the budgets did not really matter. Um, so it was a lot of support on revenue, you know, you know, being there, I sat on the sales floor, right, which is sometimes they typical, all the finance teams were embedded. So I sat right outside the CRO's office, he was actually in my like onboarding group. 
So I had like a relationship with him. So I get pulled in with him. I sent out like a daily re sales report, right? And I was pulling all this data from Salesforce and NetSuite and making sure the color coding is right on our sales performance for all the different sales channels. You know, it was very like, you know, starting and it's like, hey, you've got these things like every day I'm sending these reports out and end of month, like three or four times a day, I'm refreshing that report. So last three or four days a month, that's all I'm doing is refreshing the report, send it out to the executives. Uh, and it was like both what I expected and not what I expected. Um, you know, I supported like our value added sales team where we essentially were selling to our customers new services. And it was a whole new world of here's how you communicate with customers. Here's different ways to get a hold of them and sell to them. And, you know, there's just all these things that in business school, you know, in, in finance, a lot of it is talking about the theory of finance, right? So like, how do you value stuff? Do you ROI, WAC calculations? You know, I, I ended up TAing for like the theory of finance class. We talk about the Fed and how that drives everything in the market, right? And so like, we don't talk about that at all in the corporate world, right? It's all just about solving, you know, what the business needs, which for us was finding ways to increase revenue, right? And, and generally efficiently, but mostly to increase revenue first and foremost. So any regrets at any point when you're doing that job you're like what did i get myself into uh no regrets the first year right i felt like i was just drinking from the fire hose really learning and then for me there was a huge like turning point like basically 11 months in i started in january you know beginning of the fall and the beginning of the next january my boss my direct manager said he was leaving right and he owned revenue at our company right he was the revenue guy and so they passed it to me so i'm like 11 months out of school you know, traditionally with corporate finance, you do expenses for a long time and then do revenue. And so for me, I just got handed the revenue model because I'd been supporting a lot of those teams. Right. And so I just had to kind of figure it out. Um, so they'd finished the annual plan and I'm essentially trying to figure out how to update it and update the forecast and work with the business. And so I think for me, if you look at like one of the big turning points in my career is like that was one of them where I was essentially entrusted with, you know, making sure the revenue for 100 million SaaS company was working, right? Like, do we have the right forecast? Are we actualizing it right? You know, I'm working directly with the CFO on here's what the story of what happened. So the CEO is reaching out to me directly with questions, right? So it was a huge leveling up moment for me. Definitely some longer nights and weekends. And we ended up raising like a convertible debt round three months in, right? So you know, whenever you're going through any kind of diligence, there's all sorts of scenarios you're doing. And so for me, it was definitely just learning and, you know, struggling, but ultimately, I think was very successful for me, right? It really like, I think jumped me a couple levels in my skill set and in my knowledge and in like my understanding of strategy that it really, really helped me. Why do you think you were able to, well, first of all, I mean, you're, you're working investment banking hours, right? Yeah. A little bit. Kind of ironic. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. There was there. definitely a lot of that, that first couple months. And there's a couple of times talking to my wife. I'm like, I don't know if I love this. I'm like, I enjoy the work, but I'm like, I'm not loving the hours, right? This is not what I had signed up for. And at least like at times with corporate jobs, like they're kind of slow. So it's like I was getting paid the same and it took like six months right before like my, you know, my new work level and responsibilities started to be more in line with my compensation, right? There was like no change because you got to wait for the cycle. And it was just definitely like, there's a lot of friction internally um, that was definitely going on. Yeah. So the, what made, what do you, why do you think you were successful and able to level up? Was it, is it you, is it your personality, is it your management? How did all that happen? Yeah, I, in this specific situation, I would say it was me because my manager left and then the new manager I reported to had no revenue experience. So it was really just like, you just go figure it out, Joe. And I was like, okay, I'm just figuring it out, right? Um, and then that per manager ended up leaving six months later, right? And then essentially I was on kind of like a revenue island, right? Where I kind of just reported to the, I reported to a manager, but I worked a lot with the VP or the CFO. So it's kind of just on an island a little bit, just doing it. And, and I think for me, the one like, core reason I was able to solve it is I'm naturally like a very curious person. Um, you know, I just want to know the why of things. And when it came to like digging through a model, you know, wanting to know the why is very valuable because essentially you're just tracing formulas all the way back. Right. And once you can trace the formula back, then it's understanding, okay, well, what's this formula trying to do? What are we trying to replicate? Because at the end of the day, all an Excel model is trying to do is, you know, replicate or model something that's happening in the real world. Right, which for us, it's like, okay, are we looking at the right sales channels or the products and what's the mix and what's the AMRR, the average monthly price they're pay paying us? And then do we have the right assumptions for like our, our attach rates, right? For our kickstarts, which is like our onboarding service, right? And then, you know, you look at the other le le levels of SaaS, it's do we have the right churn rates or expansion rates? And it's all just like, what are we doing in the real world? And what are we doing? Like what strategies do we have to influence that? And you're just reflecting that in numbers. You know, so I, you know, for me, it was a good understanding that like, hey, the models are like really cool. But at the end of the day, they need to also be a reflection of what the business is doing. And I found that at times a simpler model can be more effective because people can understand it, right? Like you can have a model. We've had models that are extremely accurate, 
but no one outside of like a couple people can understand what's going on, right? And so sometimes it's like, well, let's just make it a little simpler. So when we talk about the assumptions, people know exactly what they are. Um, even if it's like, you know, 3% less accurate, it's much easier to have a conversation with the business. And for us, we're a very small finance team, a smaller company that sometimes the speed to execution is more valuable than the, you know, absolute accuracy. Yeah. So when you joined Keep, first of all, what does Keep do just for the listeners? Yeah. So Keep sells essentially a CRM for small businesses at its core. So if anyone's used Salesforce, um, essentially think of a CRM for small businesses. Some of our competitors in the past have been like Active Campaign or HubSpot. When you think of someone like MailChimp, MailChimp's a little smaller. They just do email, right? We do, you know, a lot more automations around campaigns and landing pages and, you know, keep business lines. So we have, we're like, we're a little more than uh, someone like a MailChimp, a little smaller than someone maybe like Salesforce. We, and then we specifically target small businesses, you know, $100,000 $100, to like 10 million in revenue, you know, have a dedicated marketing person. Um, usually in a, like some coaching consulting kind of role where our best customers, but we have people from across the spectrum. So when you joined, how many employees? When I joined, it was like just under 500 employees. And how many now? It's like 330. So it's definitely shrunk a okay. little bit. So your, but your growth has been meteoric, right? Yep. For, for yourself. So, uh, you've been there seven years. Yeah, it'll be seven years in January. Seven years. And you go from coming in as, as a financial analyst to now senior director mm -hmm. of finance. So tell me, like, uh, the, I mean, because you just don't see that, right? That's with one company, anyways, yeah. that growth. Um, w w tell me about the bumps and bruises along the way. Like, what stands out to you? And, and um, what would you, anything you would have done differently? Yeah. So I think, you know, talking about that growth, like we just talked about the story of taking over revenue, you know, less than a year in, uh, I think there, it, that's kind of emblematic of what has happened, right? Is it has been, I have been like the best internal choice and where, you know, I am qualified, but also they don't feel the need to look external for any of the promotions. Right. Cause sometimes, you know, when like a leader will leave, they'll just say, you know what, let's just find someone external. Like no one on the team is ready. And for me, what's happened is as people have left, they just look at the team and they say, you know what? We think Joe's the right choice for the role, right? And so it was, man, it was you know, analyst and senior analyst and lead analyst. And when I was a lead analyst, I was essentially doing all the revenue function with one or two people under me. And then there was another inflection point where we uh, invested in a tool called Looker. It's a BI tool. And so I, I remember kind of having the choice where it's like, hey, we're bringing in this whole analytics team and I could either choose to like, immerse myself and learn, or I could choose to not. And so I actually remember it was over Christmas break. I'm sitting there trying to teach myself SQL and LookML, which is their SQL and Looker, um, before everyone comes back so that I can be ready to just jump in, right? Because I had no experience with SQL. I didn't know what it was. So I'm downloading all these free tools and did some paid trainings. And so for me, I had an opportunity to jump in and essentially add an analytics skill set. You know, I wouldn't say I'm like a data engineer, but I can do what most, I think, senior data analysts can do. Um, just because I chose to jump in and co-build our entire instance, you know, so we in finance today, we use a lot of data tables, right. That's built on what our analytics team has done. And like, I've built all those tables, right. And like, I kind of know what's going on. And so for me, that was like a second inflection point where I added this whole skill set that made me extremely valuable and efficient. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit after that, we combined kind of our finance teams. We had like my finance team, which was revenue and analytics. And then we had the other one that was like purely expense. And when one of the managers left there, essentially I was the natural choice to bridge the whole teams together, right? And so it's just as people left, it was always like, we just have Joe do that. And then this in this latest iteration, you know, last November, our CFO left. And, you know, they had two choices, which is we could try to hire someone right away. We could get a temporary person. And they just decided to, you know, kind of promote me to director. And I essentially bridged the function until our new CFO started this July. So it was about eight months without a CFO. And so as part of that, you know, like I'm like presenting to the board. I presented our annual plan. I presented our financial results. You know, I attended our investor meetings and presented there, right? I got to be, you know, kind of a, a strong voice of reason for the finance side of the house, you know, and provide recommendations to the executive team. And, you know, I ended up leading kind of a director team that was driving on some tactical solutions. So it was a great opportunity for me to, you know, really spread my wings and become more of that strategic leader where in the past, you know, I've done all the tactical, you know, modeling and work. Um, so it's been a really cool opportunity for me at Keep. And, you know, I, I like to say that some of it's luck, you know, but I, my grandfather used to always say, you make your own luck, right? Like luck is just, you know, being prepared so that when something comes, you know, you're, you're ready to take advantage of it. So that, that's my next question. Put yourself in the shoes of the, the people that were choosing you saying we have this internal 
easy internal pick here and it's Joe. Why you versus somebody sitting next to you? I think the biggest reason is that I, you know, I, I want to say I'm outstanding. That's very, no, I don't, but you can throw the humble well, pie away. Yeah. You know, right now, just, it's literally like we're trying to, to help people out of how do you differentiate yourself? I think the biggest thing is that I learned the business better than any of the other financial analysts. Like at its core, I understood you know, like if I was just supporting revenue, it's like I knew all the ins and outs of revenue, right? Like our acquisition, our expansion, our churn. You know, I, when we needed to figure out payments, I'm the one that like jumped in and worked with our payments people to figure that whole world out, right? And so like whenever there was an opportunity, I just would always naturally jump in, whether asked or unasked, right? And I think that's the biggest differentiator, taking the initiative and going and learning it. And then, you know, as part of that, you're building relationships with the different people in those seats. So like if the, you know, VP is talking to their peers, it's like, well, who do you like the most? It's like, well, they have a relationship with me because I've been making the effort, right? Uh, making the effort and trying to, you know, show myself to be successful. And I, and like I talked earlier, a lot of that's driven by like my deep desire to understand the why, right? Naturally, it comes easy to me, but I feel like that's what made me the natural choices. Like of all the people, I just had the most institutional knowledge because I've gone and accumulated it. And I understood what the business was doing or trying to do. I've been a business partner with a lot of people and I just kept, you know, just inserting myself. So whenever there was like a special project that's like we need someone from finance i would just always raise my hand right i'm always like i'll do it even though it's more work because for me it's like i want to learn new things and it makes you more valuable what does that go back to where does that internal drive is it from childhood is is it your grandpa like what where do you think that originated i think that's a great question you know this is like the nature nurture when it comes to raising kids i think it's probably a combination of both i definitely come from like a like a high performing background, right? Like my, my dad's an attorney. He has like, you know, he got his law degree. My mother is, she's currently a principal here in the Valley. Um, but she has a master's degree. So like very successful people, you know, my parents would intentionally try to like include us in conversations. Like my mom and dad have said, whenever they see people doing good things or bad things that we knew, like whether it's in our church group or in our family, they'd like talk through the situation with us, right? Like, here's what they did. Well, here's what they didn't so that we could learn from others they were coming, you know, when I look at like my mother's family, like all of her siblings are, you know, extremely successful, right? Like extremely wealthy. And a lot of that was came from their father, right? Who was extremely wealthy and successful. So, and then same on my dad's side, my grandfather, very, very successful attorney, read Udall Shumway Lyon, which is a, you know, very large law firm in Fiend Mesa. And, you know, that has just been kind of bred into us, right? That you just see successful people, you see what that takes. And so then you just try to emulate and model that. That's fascinating. And what, how are you going to model that for your kids? Um, I think a lot of it is finding, making sure they understand the value of an education, um, but also like not just ed, not not just the act of going to school, but the act of actually learning. Right, being a lifelong learner. I know it's a very cliche phrase, but I think gives you a leg up. Right, if you're constantly just improving yourself every day, um, you know it, you will naturally just be further ahead than someone that is not. Right. Like I at our company right now, we're talking about this goal of improving one percent every day. Right. And the concept is if you pursue if you improve one percent every day and you look back in a year, you will be more than three hundred sixty five percent better. Right. You'll be significantly better. Uh, and like I think instilling that in myself and then helping my children understand that and like you have ups and downs. But the goal is to strive to be better every day, even if you don't necessarily see the progress right away. That's um, commendable. Right. Cause it doesn't necessarily exist. And I think one of the hardest things in the world is raising good kids. It's, it's a challenge, right? So, um, I wish you luck on that journey and I hope you're as successful as your parents were and your grandparents were. That's no, thank you. I, it's definitely a different world now, right? I, uh, looking at my siblings. So I graduated high school in 2009. So like one of my friends had an iPhone and my sister who's seven years younger, everyone had smartphones, right? Like I didn't get my first smart home till after my mission when I came home. And I just feel like the microscope and bubble that they live in, right? Where you can see all the short form content. You can see what everyone's doing at any moment. Like for me, that didn't exist. Like I got a Facebook in like 2007, but it was just kind of like, oh, we posted some pictures, but like we weren't on it very much, right? And it's just like the world is so different today than it was for us. And so just finding a way to make sure like our kids stay connected to nature and like, you know, go out and do, you know, we have iPads, but it's like, we try to limit that time, right? Just because I think there's a lot of value in just, you know, the power of imagination. Kids will find stuff to play with, right? Um, you just have to force them to do it, right? And I feel like that's part of, you know, helping them, you know, grow. But, you know, we've talked about it, like, it's definitely hard, right? Like we, you know, every, every, and I think every generation says that, right? It's a whole new world and the world's always changing and you just have to figure out what works best. Yeah, I wonder what my parents said when, oh yeah. my gosh, he's growing up on color TV. What's yeah. that going to do to him? <laughs> yeah, 
color TV. Now we have HD and 4K. You know, <laughs> we can actually see what's going on. I was so. telling, uh, the, I was having lunch with some guys yesterday. I said, I said, my favorite gift that I ever got was an Atari. And I'm sure my parents were like, oh my gosh, he's going to be sitting there. He's playing Asteroids for like two hours at a time. And if you think back, that was a big revolution, the, yeah. the home video game. And I sure I played a lot of Missile Command and, and Asteroids, but I think I turned out all right because we still had the bikes. Uh, that was yeah. much more fun. You got bored of playing the games. And, and when I look at my children, they're different. Like um, one does like his computer, but he plays strategy games, you know, and the other one doesn't even have a computer. If he does, he doesn't do much on it. He's always doing other things outdoors. So I, I think a lot of that is personality driven yeah. as well. So, but it is a scary thing because when they're younger and you, the distraction here, here's an iPad, watch a show. Yeah. I, I, one thing I've noticed for me, so I grew up, you know, playing some video games. My dad was really big into strategy games. We played like Starcraft and Warcraft. And, you know, like as an aside, I remember the first time I beat my dad, I was like seven years old in Starcraft. I essentially did like a little drone rush on him. And it was like, and I remember hearing him yell and get frustrated and quitting. And it was like one of like a very proud moment to me. And that to me, that's something I've actually done with my kids. We're like, I do not let my child beat me. Like we play chess, my seven year old nine, like I beat him every time, but I know that the day he actually beats me, It'll be a big accomplishment, right? I don't want you, I don't want to let you win, right? I want you to earn it. And it's a huge, you know, it's a huge win. It's the same reason I hate playing Candyland because I lose every time because it's all luck. Um, <laughs> but for me, I'm like, I feel like that's part of, you know, instilling that in your kids. It's just that competitive drive and, you know, wanting to win. And like that can manifest in different ways. But the desire to win, I think, is very valuable in being successful, right? Because you have to want it. I think kids are going to be able to tell if, if you gave up too. Yes, you know, oh, and, totally. and, and let them win. And, and then it doesn't mean anything. Correct. I remember when my son first beat me in golf and I was trying, I, yeah. I was not letting that kid beat me. And it's the same thing. I listen to Tiger Woods talking about Charlie Woods. You know, he's like, yeah. he's just, I'm not going to let him beat yeah. me just to, to do it. So that's, yeah, but, that's huge. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value in getting that like sense of accomplishment, right? Cause you think of our lives, right? Like a lot of what we do is, you know, finding ways to find gratification or happiness, right? And like, there is something to earning something as opposed to me giving something, right? So like, just like earning the, op the opportunity to like beat your dad at something, right? Like, it's kind of like a big opportunity or task in life, right? Because for a lot of kids, like your dad or your mom, your parents, your grandparents, they can be your heroes. And so to finally like surpass them in something is a big deal. Uh, and it's like a good, I think, opportunity, like object lesson to provide them, right? By not letting them win. Absolutely. So that's a great life lesson and a good thing for parents to, yeah. to think about as well, because too many times parents, I think they're busy and they just give their kids something to keep them busy. And, you know, they're not involved in their lives. And it sounds like you're very involved in your lives. And that's try something. to be, and I, I will say sometimes we'll just put the TV on. Right. But, uh, you know, we try to, you know, especially now that the weather's getting better, right? Like I know I came down today and my son had, you know, snuck downstairs. My two boys were watching some TV and it's like, no guys, the weather's good. We'll go outside. We have an in-ground tramp. And I'm like, you can run around and play in our backyard. Like, let's just be out there. It's, you know, a lot better than just, you know, sitting and vegging. So we definitely try to encourage that in them and be, be responsible. Um, but you know, we're definitely by no means perfect. It's not like we have a no electronics rule either, you know, but it's, you know, usually it's like, we're doing it as a, like, if we're doing it, we're doing it as a family, right? It's not solo, which is what can happen with the iPads. Well, mine turned out all right. Yeah. So I think they'll be fine. You know, my brother, <laughs> like talking about the video games. So my brother actually ended up being like a pseudo professional video game player, you know? So he, uh, he played this MOBA it was called, but he, uh, he won ASU tuition for a year or, or, or for the rest of college from Blizzard, the company that makes it. Oh my gosh. You know, so you got to meet Michael Crow and got, you know, you know, presented or paraded around. So that was a really cool experience. Then went professional in that game, then streamed on Twitch. And it was like, it's the kind of thing where it's like, we always joke that video games are like, you know, whatever. Uh, but like it, it became a pseudo career for him, right. For a couple of years. And now he's, you know, transitioning to being a nurse, but it was a really cool opportunity. Like a documentary was made about him or about his journey. Um, that, you know, it's like a really cool thing, right? That like video games are not just the time sink. Maybe some people think, but I also think it's all in moderation. Like for me, when I've enjoyed video games, it's when I'm playing with people I know. It's about the community you're building, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just playing alone. You know, so I think that's that's where you got to find the balance, right? It's like, do does this provide you a community that's like making you a better person? If the answer is yes, I'm like, go for it. So yeah, fascinating. And your brother's name? Michael. Michael Udall or Mike Udall. If anybody wants to look it up and read about his story, that's yeah. I wish I knew what the documentary is called, but yeah, it was on. I'm sure you it's Google on YouTube. It. It's on YouTube somewhere. Mark Cuban's in it, so it's kind of a cool, 
cool little thing. He was on ESPN three, um, like his, you know, tournament at the end that he won. It was called heroes of the dorm. So it's a really, really cool experience. You know, we went and supported him when he was there in Seattle. And so it was, he had, he'd gotten second the year before he'd lost the year before. And so it was really cool to like watch the arc of him come back and kind of win it like in a very dominant fashion the following year. So that's fascinating. Yeah. That's so fascinating. That's so cool. So tell me, um, uh, your a, are you a natural leader and when, and I think you might be, but when you had that first leadership experience, tell me about that and, and what did you learn and what did you learn about yourself? Yeah. So I, uh, I actually been reflecting on this. We did like a whole experience on tell us your journey as a leader at work recently, right. To help us, you know, think about this. And so for me, it really goes back to kind of like the beginning for me, like literally like I'm the oldest child. I'm like the second oldest cousin and the fourth oldest cousin on each side with lots of cousins. Right. So I feel like a, from a young age, I was kind of thrust into leadership, even though from like disposition, I'm a little more introverted, right? Like it's not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm like a natural, like raw, raw leader. Uh, I've always been from the time I was young is like a do as I do, right? Like follow my example kind of leader. And I know in like, I've learned in business that like that works up to a point, but at some point you need to learn to delegate, right? You need to learn to inspire, right? So like that worked as a child, you know, and then I did, I like did Boy Scouts. So I was an Eagle Scout and, um, you know, on my mission, I had, you know, all the leadership roles, right? Like the, you know, the very last one, the assistant, you're essentially, I was leading a team of 180 missionaries across the mission in different areas. So it's like, I've had a lot of this natural leadership given or thrust upon me throughout my life. Right. So I feel like I've been, which in some ways is nice. Cause like the first time I was like a lead or a manager in business, it wasn't my first time, right? Like I've been doing this my whole life. Um, I do think the thing that is very different in business, right. Is one, you're dealing primarily with adults. Right. So it can't just be as like the older brother, I can physically overpower you. Right. Like if I have to lead by force, you can. Like you can't really do that in business. Right. You have to, you have to understand what motivates people and how you get them to buy in um, to what you're doing. And then, you know, it's interesting that like I, I like to be as honest and transparent as possible. Right. And in finance, sometimes like that is at odds with what I'm asked to do. Right. Like anytime you're going through a transaction, often it was like the CFO would tell me, you cannot tell your team about this. Right. And so it's like, I don't want to lie to them. And so you have to like, you know, how do I keep get their help with some things without, without telling them what they are? Right. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, navigating you have to do where, you know, like for me personally, I like to be very honest and transparent, but like, that's not always possible. Um, so I, for me, leadership, I think has been natural, but also unnatural. And I think like I am striving to improve on my, you know, how can I inspire people and coach them up? Um, cause that's not something I've had to do as much right in my life. And so I think for me, that's been like where I've really been focused the last couple of years. How did you come to that realization? Because there's the, uh, Eagle scout. I'm, I'm the Eagle scout. You're the, the cub or whatever. Yeah. Do what I say. There's the military leadership style. Same thing. Do what I say. You're going to get court martialed. Uh, then there's the trying to understand what makes people motivated and then focus on that. And here's how I'd help you achieve that by yeah. this. How did, tell me about that transition of learning that. Did you read a book? Did somebody help you out on that? Because I had to learn that myself. I'm very much the, Hey, I'm out front. I'm running. I want everybody running just fast right behind me. And I did that. And then I looked back and I went, uh, nobody's behind me. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think it was, it was a combination of, I realized at some point that like what I had been doing was not working. Right. Like I had some analysts that like that first style worked, right. They're just like, just follow, do the same thing. Right. That's the style they wanted. And then I have other analysts that were, they're just like, that does not work for them. They want to understand why they want to like be more involved. They want to have stuff better explained to them than just like do this. Cause that's what we need to do. Right. Like, or this is the right way to do things. And so it really just came down from like some friction with some relationships and just learning, okay, how do I resolve this? And someone was talking to people internally. Someone was talking to my parents, like my mom, like I said, she's a principal, right? So she deals with tons of people all the time. And I think just getting that advice from them was very helpful and just learning like, Hey, this do as I do style works for some people. It doesn't work for everyone. Right. And so just having to modify uh, and adapt has kind of been kind of the journey I've been on. Gotcha. I, I learned about a concept called servant leadership and that's yeah. what I follow. So it's yeah. that serving the people themselves. So I'm there to serve as a leader. I'm here to serve you, but I have to know what makes you tick, what your yeah. motivations are. So that was a, a transformation that I had to go to go through. And I, I, think, I think I'm still yeah. growing as a leader. Uh, it's one of the most challenging things for me because I'm slightly introverted as well. 
I could just sit there on the weekend and work on my vehicle yeah. all weekend and, and just be fine. Whereas my wife's a little, you know, she needs to socialize and stuff like that. So, um, so it's, it's interesting that you yeah. recognize that though. That's like, cool. Yeah. It sounds like we're in the same marriage. My wife, very extroverted and I'm like 45% extrovert, 65 for whatever, 55% introvert. I'm definitely, definitely hedged there a little bit. And yeah, no, it's definitely been a, a journey and an experience. And I feel like it's something that for me as a more introverted person, it's something I'm going to always have to focus on, right? Like the, you know, do as I do is just comes naturally. And then the other one does not. Right. And so you got to work on the things that you're not good at. Mm -hmm. Without getting anybody in trouble. Do you see yourself and and people that you've managed in the past and and has it stood out to you and it reminded you of yourself? Yeah, no, there was definitely one analyst, Jared, who I think I've told him this, um, who he, he left like a year ago, but he very much reminded myself. He was like, essentially I hired him. I was three years in, you know, he was, he'd been at IBM, but just the way that he worked and approached um, the job was very similar to me, right? And it's been really cool to watch his progression and development. And, you know, he, he interestingly has kind of wanted to pursue more of the data analyst path, right? Where we both started and did the finance and data. And for him, he really wanted to do the data stuff. So I just kept giving him more and more and more. And now that's kind of where his career has taken him. So it's been awesome to watch him kind of grow and blossom in, you know, starting in finance, but finding, you know, a different passion. Is it tough to let somebody go like that? I was really sad when he left. And then there was an analyst right before him, Jake, who like the three of us had been together for two or three years. We were together when COVID hit, right? So it's like you go through that. I don't, I don't want to call it traumatic, but it's just like a big life shakeup, right? Um, and so it was definitely the two of them left within like three or four months of each other. And so it was definitely like a hard transition, right, for me. Um, but like obviously always excited for someone's next steps, right? Like my philosophy has always been you should do what's best for you and like, for me, in some ways, I see it as like a success that you've like outgrown what you could do here, right? Like to me, that means you've been successful and I've helped coach and mentor you. Um, so like I see that as a win, even though if personally for me, it makes it hard, right? It makes my day to day harder. But like that, that shouldn't stop you from doing what's best for you. No, you have to let them go. Yeah. You have to let them grow. I, it's I'd like to say it's good preparation for preparation for when my children grow and leave the house, right? I get experience this in a micro way. Um, so I'll be a little more prepared for when they, you know really start pushing back in their teenage years and then, you know, want to leave and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. So I have hired a lot of people and, and, um, not all of them still work for yeah. me. I find one of the hardest things is, is interviewing people and, and trying to figure out what people, what makes people tick. So what do you look for, especially in a junior candidate, right? So we're, we're this audience, uh, a lot of these are going to be students. And they're thinking about how to prepare for their first interview and stuff like that. What do you look for when you are interviewing junior staff? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. It's actually one I think I've struggled the most with because I, I feel like when I was in school, there was all these like, oh, you do these case studies and you have all like your star stories ready. But it, like at its core, right, like all they're trying to really filter for is like, are you smart enough to do the job? And do you have like the right approach and temperament at its core, right? That's what I'm looking for. Because most people coming out of school, we will teach you a lot of the technical skills, like unless you're like completely incompetent in Excel, most of them have some experience, different levels of experience, but you can train them up on what you need, right? And they're going to have to learn whatever models we're doing anyways. And unless they like have worked in SaaS or intern in SaaS, we're gonna have to teach them a SaaS business anyways, right? Um, so for them, I'm really trying to figure out, are, can you think the right way? And so I actually do something maybe that's a little bit atypical in the interviews is I like to kind of give them an overview of the role. I'll ask them a little bit about experience. And then like my go-to is actually to just give them time and see what kind of questions they ask. And then I will kind of respond to that. Uh, and the reason I do that is at least at keep a lot of what our job is, is ambiguous, right? It is not, you know, we, we have like our set things we do, but the support you're going to do for the business is going to be different every month, right? And like what their needs are, are going to be different. And so I need someone that's willing to kind of ask the types of questions to extract from the business what we need, right? They're going to say like, I want to find a way to grow sales. They're not going to, and you have to interpret, okay, what are the metrics you need to go find? And like, what are the actuals? And who are the people that are going to drive those, right? And you have to like connect a lot of the dots on your own. Um, which can be very hard coming out of school and some, like some roles, they're just, you're just going to show up and they're like, here's like your box, right? Like we, we are a much smaller company. Like you're going to support directly our CRO or our CMO or our CPO, right? Like you're, you're supporting exec right away. Uh, which is why we generally don't hire brand new. I was actually a very atypical in that they hired me straight out of school. Um, so for me, it's much more, can you think, are you naturally 
curious and going to ask the right types of questions. And by giving them that platform, they, I get to see how they approach it. Cause there's some that I can tell after, you know, five minutes, I'm like, this isn't going to work, right? You don't have the right approach and mentality. Um, you probably haven't done any prep work, right? Cause usually at least like, you don't have to understand SaaS, but like, it's not that hard to Google. How does a SaaS company work? And to understand like, you know, the basic pillars of a SaaS company. I'm shocked when people, uh, when younger kids would come, I don't want to throw any particular programs under the bus, but they would show up and a, they wouldn't have time, have anything to ride on, yeah. which blew my mind. Have you seen that before? There's been a couple, you know, it's, it's been <laughs> interesting that like now with, in, in like the post COVID environment, so many of my interviews are over zoom, right? So it's like, you should have something to ride on. And I would hope you have some questions prepared. Right. Mm -hmm. But, and that's, that's what I coach when I, coach anybody in and in and I have a pretty extensive interview coaching process that I go through but the standard is do your research yeah do the research on the person that you are interviewing with do the research on the company do the research on any news that's come out and then formulate interesting questions based on what you've read and show that you have interest in the company because too many people have come in and interviewed with me and they're like, okay, so what are you going to do for me? What's this company going to do for me? That's you're dead in the water at that point, especially in an entry level role, right? Like, you know, you need to show that you're willing to look and do the work. And like, at least for my industry, SaaS, right? Like there are very standard SaaS questions you could ask, right? Like, like what's like, what's your retention rate? You know, what's your, you know, is your ARR growing? You know, what's your, you know, growth rate, right? Like you can ask very basic things and it shows me at least understand what metrics we cared about. What are you, what's your LTV to CAC? How do you measure it? Right? Like there's very simple questions you can ask. And I'm like, okay, you at least, you may not understand SaaS, but you know, you like a Google search gets you there, right? Like you go to Google, what are the top metrics in SaaS and just look them up. And they, they may have like slightly different names in different places, but it's core. You're just, you're really just trying to understand what's the retention and are, you know, are you spending all the money now? And is it going to get you where you need to go? Because with SaaS, it's like a trough, right? You spend the money now, you're in the hole for some number of months, and then you start making money on that cohort in the future, right? It's not like a widget where, you know, I spend $5 on a widget and sell it for 10. This is like, I spend a million dollars to get $10,000, which is a really bad ratio. And then over time, you know, it pays back. Mm -hmm. They spend, you spend a million dollars to get a hundred thousand. And then, you know, in 10 months it pay, breaks even. And then from there, you know, you're making money. Right. And so you just stack cohorts and cohorts and cohorts and get the retention as good as possible. And then before you know it, you have a, a company that's making money hands over fist. That's why with SaaS companies, you can see like the crazy 50%, hundred percent quarter over quarter, year over year growth rates is because they've done all the work to stack it. And then now it starts all paying off right, right at the same time. Yeah. So going back to your interview, I know you had an inside edge on that, but did you do Google research and what did you do to prepare? Yeah. You're taking me to the way back machine. Um, <laughs> you know, I know I definitely Googled SaaS companies to try to understand. And I do know that Austin had given me a couple questions to ask. And, and then the other thing that I like to do now, um, is I try to understand, you know, like what's the current state of like the team. Um, and, you know, often I think that's helpful for you as a someone coming in, because you understand what like the dynamic looks like, it's much easier to understand how are you supposed to fit in that picture, right? Like, or like, am I coming in as a junior analyst? Okay, then you can start asking, like, what kinds of work do I do who I interact with? Like, it's very simple to just start getting in and some of that you can look up some of it you can't. Um, so I know I asked some of those kind of questions, I definitely asked, like, what happened to the prior analyst, right? I think that's a very common question. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, it's been a long time. You know, I'm, I'm doing more interviews now, but now right now I care a lot more about culture and fit, right? Like, yeah. you know, what kind of company, you know, why did the prior director leave? Because that can often tell you a lot about the state of the company. I know I've talked to somewhere. I'm like, you know what? That doesn't sound like the right culture for me. Like, I'm obviously in a polo right now. I usually wear like a hat and T-shirt most days to work. Like I work in tech. It's very casual, you know, very much. You show up and you do your job. That's what matters, right? Not, you know, am I dressed, you know, in the appropriate business casual or whatever, right? Like those things do not matter as much. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so any, what, so, you know, and, and I like to kind of finish on this, but going back, what's something that you wish you knew when you were in school or at least in your first call it six months after graduation in your new job, what's something that you wish you knew? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. I think, you know, one thing I think maybe I wish I had done more preparation on was understanding, you know, exactly what the different finance or accounting paths where they can take you. You know, I feel like in some ways I've been very fortunate and that like 
I have been able to rise very quickly. But, you know, I, there is there is a good chance where I see people's resumes where it's like you'll go into a corporate finance job and you could just get stuck there for a while. Like Jared that I was talking about, he was at IBM for two years and he basically said it's like they didn't always have work for people. Like, you know, it was very difficult to grow. The managers changed a lot. And so I feel like sometimes it's like, hey, you get a big name on your resume. It's going to be helpful. But sometimes those those jobs are not as conducive to growth as like a smaller company can be. So I would say like, as you're trying to explore what it is, try to talk to people, like network with people that are in jobs. Cause like, I know for me, like if I have a student reach out, I will usually jump on a call with them and talk to them. Right. Like, I think there's a lot to be learned just from people that are in the industry, what they're doing, the paths they've taken. Cause you know, there are like the core, you know, paths where it's like you do big four accounting or you do investment banking, or you go work for some big corporation in their rotational program. Those are very standard and like those lead to certain paths. And I've taken definitely a much more or less traditional path, right? I started a tech company, which is really good, uh, but it's not a big one, right? So because of that, I've been able to touch and experience essentially everything you can do in finance at, at this company, right? I've touched all of it, um, you know, helped lead and drive strategy for a lot of it. And so that's been very unique. Whereas some people, it's like you just supported this one business unit the whole time. And so I would say like, know what you want. And, and as part of what I've done, it means it's a little less ambiguous. You have to be a little more of a stealth starter. It can mean like my clothes is not always consistent, right? Or my hours are not consistent because there's just more stuff that can happen and go on. So just know that, you know, where you go is going to have a big, you know, driver on your future. And sometimes I wish maybe I should have done a little more preparation and research on like what it meant to work for a tech company, you know, because I was just like, oh, just looking at different jobs. And this is kind of was the best option I had. So. so for the listeners that didn't pick up on it, you are out interviewing and you're transitioning. Yep. Uh are you finding based on your background i'm going to expose you a little bit here but are you finding on based on your background resistance you did mention the cpa but are you finding any resistance and in, in questions of hey why'd you choose this route versus going another route does that come up um i don't get the questions as much there i do know there have been some like director or vp or head of finance roles that i look at that basically it's like if i don't have the cpa or I didn't do investment banking. There are some that it's like, that's just like the deal breaker, right? Right away. Now there are plenty of others that I can go through. And then the other big, I guess, like barrier for me is like, I have just under seven years experience. You know, a lot of times for those roles, it's eight to 10 or 12 plus. So like, that is what I am. That's more like the ceiling I run to into at times, right? For some companies, it's fine. For others, like it definitely is a barrier where it's like, you know, and, and to me, in some ways, it's kind of a blessing where they, like if a company says you have to have 12 years experience, that tells me a lot about like maybe the culture and how rigid they are, um, which may not be like the best fit for me. Right. Like I don't necessarily need a place that's extremely rigid on like those kind of hiring requirements because it could tell me that maybe they aren't as open to kind of like the changes maybe that need to be made. Right. Like it could tell you a lot about the internal culture with the way sometimes they'll just filter candidates. Mm hmm. Well, a, a natural fact that our listeners should should know is when you get into these big corporations, it's very lockstep. Yep. There's a lot of requirements, and it's not necessarily the hiring manager that has those requirements. It's probably going to be human resources. They've sure. got to have this many years. You've got to have this degree. You've got to have a CPA, and or it's just not going to work. And so if you go to those larger corporations, uh, you can... Um, run into that right and you and and so what else what also happens though is you have those big companies that say i want somebody with big company experience because they understand yep. that and then you get somebody from a smaller company says i don't want somebody from a big company because they're not as versatile yeah as somebody like yourself that's done a lot of different things instead of like you said here's your box then here's your next box here's your next box you've been exposed to so many different things which has allowed you to rise quickly in your titles and so it's kind of interesting you can choose one path or the other and most of the guests that i've had on here have been uh they've had public company experience and they've had smaller company experience and it seems like they all seem to really gravitate towards that smaller company experience because you're the the big fish smaller pond can see your impact greater your direct yep. impact yep. on the company here it is that's what i did i accomplished this for sure. And I think there is something very gratifying, right? To know it's like, I just did all this work. And then you see the company shift and change and to just see like the positive or the negative, right? But just to know like you were directly involved, right? And like th what you do every day really matters. Or I know I've talked to people that worked at, you know, Intel or larger companies where they're like, sometimes they're like, I feel like if I didn't show up, it wouldn't have mattered, right? Which on, frankly is probably true at some of the really big companies, right? Like if you don't show up for a little bit, it's fine, right? Like they'll probably fire you, but it's not like the company's going to go down where 
you know, like for our analysts, conversely, sometimes it's like, hey, if you're like gone for like, if you just leave, like that can put like a real crimp on what we can do, right? Just because you're smaller and leaner, right? So it matters, but I think it also includes its own level of stress and pressure, right? So I think just for new people, you just have to understand like, what is it that you want out of life, right? Like, what do you want out of a job? If you just want a place you can show up and get a paycheck and then kind of check out sometimes, like the big companies actually are like, at times, I think very good for that. You can show up, you can start your side hustle on the side. You know, I have done some of that here. You know, I had like a data analytics consultancy from some of my coworkers here, right? So I've been able to do pieces of that here, but definitely there's a lot of pressure and stress sometimes where it's like, I know like if I am not there, like there's just stuff that other people struggle to do or won't be able to do as well, especially if the team's in any kind of transition. And not that there's anything right or wrong about wanting to be ambitious and, and go and get the CFO yep. title versus somebody that wants to come in, be a team player, execute their job at five o'clock, leave and go home and do their own thing. Right. What they matters is what you want out of life. What do you want it to be? Cause like to be a CFO, right. There's going to be, yeah, you'll make more money, but there's a lot more stress, a lot more hours. And you just have to just like, ultimately I think if I was there, I think if you ask people like, Oh yeah, I want to be a CFO. And it's like, well, do you really know what that means? Right. So you, at some point you just have to understand like, what is it that you want out of life? Right. Cause you can make a ton of money. You can have like an amazing work life balance. There are some places you can do both of those, but they're harder to find, right? Like in a lot of ways, you got to pick a path, right? And I know listening to some of your other podcasts, a lot of them talked about it's like a lot of hours and a lot of work and they've gotten to where they're at, right? And maybe you can enjoy more of it later. I've been lucky in that I feel like my work-life balance has actually been pretty good, you know, 80% of the time all along the way, right? There's been obviously periods of stress when you're doing some kind of transaction or starting something really new. But for the most part, I'm like, I can work, you know, a 40 to 50 hour week most weeks, Right. And now in the post COVID world, we're hybrid. I'm home three days a week. So I've gotten to, with my oldest child, you know, he was like four when COVID hit. And so I missed, you know, I was kind of around, but I missed a lot of that with my younger two. My young, my daughter was six months old when COVID hit. So I've got to see like everything. You know, I was got to see her walk and start talking. And my youngest son, I've just been able to be around and, you know, you can do like lunch with them, you know, or pick them up from school or some of the stuff that, you know, in the old world I couldn't do. And so you know, understanding what it is that you want out of life will help you, I think, make better decisions and where you go. And in some ways, like I would argue if you're single and like you really want to like drive forward on a career, like you really should do big four or IB, right? Like the best time to do that is when you just have you and you can really, I think, accelerate your career in a lot of ways, right? Like it, it gives you a leg up, I think, moving forward, but you just have to know what's going to work for you um, and what you want out of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's so cool that um, that you're getting to see your kids. Do you feel that that pendulum is going to swing back on the hybrid? Just I'm asking you that because I've seen it a little bit. And we, as a recruiting company, we don't necessarily work on remote jobs because they're very easy to fill. So we're working on the ones where they want them in five days a week, yeah. that kind of thing. Do you do you sense that? I mean, you're out talking to other companies do you sense that pendulum coming back i do think it's coming back and i think you know it's, it's very interesting where there are a lot of people that have these long leases like i know for us like we are in our building to like 26 or something right like we are we're in a long lease so for us it's like we're either using it or we're just like wasting it right so i think for a lot of companies there is a pressure to bring people back and some of it may be financial you know i do like personally i believe there is something to being in person right like i think there is um, like a connection that is hard to make through zoom. And I would argue that, especially if you are new an in-person job is going to help accelerate you faster than a remote job, just because there are all the water cooler moments, right? Where you just run into people and you can build those relationships and, you know, okay, we just had this meeting and as we're walking to our next meeting or whatever, I can connect with someone, um, like that does not happen on zoom as naturally, right? Like, or on web conferencing, it's just, it's just not as natural to happen. So I do think newer in your career in person will help you more. Um, remote does give you more flexibility. I know like for my next role, I'm looking at both in-person hybrid remote. And if it is a remote one, you know, I'm always like, Hey, I'm definitely willing to come in, a, a, especially a lot the first six months. Cause I know how valuable it is to come build those relationships, uh, with people. I just think it's easier to build the relationships and humanize them in person. Right. So, uh, I think some form of hybrid is probably going to exist. I think it'll never be the same as it was, but I do think the pendulum is swinging back to more companies, bringing people in, um, than before, right? Before you had a lot of, you had a lot of remote and a lot of in office and not a ton of hybrid. I think you'll see more hybrid now, but I, I do think the pendulum's coming back. And I think some of it's frankly, is driven by the commercial real estate, right? Like people are paying for it. So you might as well bring people back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's driving Google and meta to bring people back though. That's good. I can't wait to see the, the, the test, the, the, um, cases on this, the yeah. case studies where they look at this 15, 20 years, yeah. 30 years from now go, 
because that was such a dramatic change in yeah. the modality of work. Yeah. And we, we got to live it and, yeah. and just, it's crazy. And so I, I look forward to seeing what happens in the future. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm old school. Like yeah. most of my career was in office every day. So, yeah. And I think, I think it's going to become very like role dependent more than it was. Cause before it was, everyone's in office. And I'm like, I think there are some roles that it's easier um, to just be remote, right? You just get less interruptions. Like I know I joke right now, like my two days in office are by far my least productive, right? Cause, because we're only in office two days, that's when all the meetings are scheduled and you're like connecting with all the people. Right. Um, and so like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that's when I like actually do work, you know, and Tuesday, Thursday is when I'm, you know, in meetings and talking to people and, um, you know, making those connections to, you know, drive the business forward. So I, I feel like that may be what it looks like moving forward. Um, it's like, I mean, more of the solo work or the hard modeling for us, right. That all happens, you know, on the days you're not in office. Cause you know, I can, you can like shut your zoom and email and you can just kind of jam. Right. Um, whereas in your office, people always come grab yeah. you or talk to you or whatever. That's so. a fact. So I grew up in the bullpen era, right. Yeah. Where everybody's in the bullpen and the managers were in the offices around, now I have millennials working for me. They're awesome. They're actually changing my mind on this. And we're doing studies on, well, you're getting more done when you're not in an office where there's distractions and music going and all this. It's, it's, and so my mindset is changing at my age. You know, you can't yeah. teach an old dog new tricks, but I'm actually coming around. We're saying, yeah, you know what? And then I start paying attention. I'm like, yeah, this is distracting. I never yeah. thought about it before. I just did it and it was what we do but now i'm starting to think about it yeah. and as a leader i have to obviously think about the the future of the company and how we're going to do it so i've learned a lot in that respect for sure yeah there's like so many little things you don't quite realize like i always joke like at home my the bathroom or the water like in my kitchen is like right next to my office where i'm at now i have to like go down the stairs and walk across the building right it's like for me going to the bathroom at home is like oh you know like it's literally a five second walk, you know, whereas in the office, it's a minute walk, right? And so like, you do that, like, and you think that adds up over the course of the year, like, you know, there's all these little things in the commute, right? Like when I'm at home, I can start at like 815 when I finish dropping off my kid, whereas in the office, I don't get there till like 845 or nine, depending on my commute, right? Like, there's all these like little times where it's like, you just lose that time where I could be working, right? Or I could be driving, right? And then when it comes to like eating food, like I my lunches are a lot faster at home, because we have leftovers, or we've already made something. Whereas if you go out to eat, right, that's an hour, an hour and a half, right? Like, I just think there's a lot of little things that it's like, okay, there's connections, but I think a hybrid approach for a lot of companies will be the most efficient. Um, even if maybe it's not, you know, it doesn't fully conform to like the way that work has been done in the past. I, I feel like there are, there are a lot of things you can do much better at home, a lot more quickly and efficiently. And I think you'll have a lot happier employees, which in some ways is, you know, just as valuable, right? Like if you're really happy, it's much easier to like go the extra mile than if you're not. Well, I'll tell you from a recruiting perspective, if you're not offering hybrid, you're going to have a challenge. Yeah. It's just a fact. And you're going to get a, a bigger pool of candidates if you're looking at, at a, if you have a hybrid first, Yeah, you know, some people say remote first, hybrid first. I learned another one where it's a, a flex schedule. You know, if you have something to do with the kids, you got to take them to the orthodontist. I have an orthodontics yeah. pen from my kids. Good one, by the way, if you need it. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Um, it's interesting how that's going to be going forward. So you are, um, you're talking to other companies. And so how do people get in touch with you? And then you also mentioned that you like talking with students, which is absolutely fantastic. And the fact that you put that out there. So what did, how do you suggest that, that people get in touch with you? Yeah, I think the easiest way for business people to get in touch to me is with my, is on my LinkedIn no, I do. My email and my phone number are on there, right? But if you just look me up on LinkedIn, it's a picture of me and my wife and my kids. Beautiful um, picture, by you know, the way. Yeah, no, it's definitely and like my Zoom background when I log in, it's just a picture of my three kids, right? Like I family is very important to me, right? And so I I find like in a professional setting, if you start with that, it often is a conversation starter, um, you know, and it, it, it I feel like it helps humanize me, which makes people naturally like you more. I think there's a lot to just like making yourself be a normal person because at the end of the day, when we're in a job or a role, like we're all people, right? We have something that we're doing outside of work. And the more people understand about that, the more they're naturally going to like you, uh, which I think can really help you. And I, I don't say that as like a way to manipulate people. I just have found like when I get to know someone, it's much easier to like have empathy and want to work with them and catch up with them. And so like that, I think, is a final piece of advice is like, as you're working with people, try to get to know them as a person, not just in their like role and title. And it will make your life easier, right? Like it just make your job easier. People will care more about you. You'll care more about them. And like, I think that can really drive, 
you know, just a lot of success for anyone, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all people, right? Like we're all living our lives and we all want to be happy and be successful, right? We all want the same things, you know, even if they come in different forms. Yeah. And, but it is important and as silly as it sounds, that LinkedIn picture is very important. Yeah. People look at that. They remember that. Yeah. And I remember that about your picture, the beautiful family. And why not be family first and put that out there? Yeah. That's fantastic. So definitely professional, right? Like yeah, it it's just a headshot. Like for a long time, it was my wedding headshot. And then I changed it to, I've been updating it every year or two to like our most recent family picture. Yeah. The, so. the picture that I don't recommend is the one where you have uh, blurry eyes and you can tell that your best friend was cut out. Yeah. No, definitely <laughs> not that. Like if it's just you, make sure it's a professional headshot or like we get, you know, professional photos taken every year uh -huh. of our family. And we actually have like in our great room, we have like these big, um, like the, used to be able to go at Costco, but the big metal like printouts, right? That we kind of hang them and then we have like one lower and then we have these other ones high and we're slowly accumulating one every year, which is kind of cool to watch our kids and it's kind of a conversation starter for people. It's so, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so that's it. LinkedIn's the best way. LinkedIn, yeah. Are LinkedIn's you on there the quite way. a bit? Yeah, especially right now. You know, <laughs> I definitely check it at least once a week, right? I'll check any messages or things to reach out. And so especially if people reach out, I'm happy to connect. And at least I have an initial call. I have kind of a philosophy. I generally will say yes to anything once, you know, which is why I said yes to this podcast, even though I'd never done one before. I feel like it's a lot of value in experiencing new things. You never know what will happen if you say yes, Absolutely. but you do know what happens if you say no, which is nothing. Absolutely. So I too can be reached on LinkedIn. I am on there daily. So I don't have the luxury going on there once a week. It is uh, as a recruiter, you live on LinkedIn. Yep. And um, so I'm on there constantly. And if you just Google me, it's Chad Dean integrated management. I come up number one on there. Fortunately, I, don't, I didn't pay for that, uh, but it happens over time. And so that's it. I want to thank you for sharing everything that you did. And, and you're a very honest person. And uh, the advice that you gave to people, just talking about your background is going to be very valuable to people. And, and I, you know, I know it's appreciated out there and I appreciate uh, you spending the time and, and getting over that barrier and and doing something new and coming on the podcast. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. It's been a great experience. And for me, it's definitely been very reflective, right? To think about my life and, you know, try to encapsulate it in an hour. Cool. So, well, maybe we can do a new one when you land your new gig, huh? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Financial Footsteps, Candid Conversations with Financial Leaders. We encourage you to apply the knowledge and wisdom shared in these conversations to your own career. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and leave a review. Your feedback is important to us as we continue to bring you more candid conversations.